be your self because when everything is done said and done you will feel much better knowing that you were really true to thyself i want to say this there was a bible study that we had a few weeks ago and the pastor posed this question what do you think is most important having a good name or having a lot of money there's a difference between a dream chaser and a dream catcher thanks all for tuning in to dream catchers where we make things happen Dreamcatchers was formally launched to unlock the hidden potential in successful, self-motivated individuals who desire to take their life's work to the next level but need support to evolve. We are a collective group of professionals with various backgrounds that use our talents to assist those individuals in realizing their wildest dreams by providing education, inspiration, and direction. This podcast is where we share the lessons we've learned along the way to catching our dreams and give you some context around the how and the why to each approach to put you further ahead on the journey to catching your dream. Are you ready? Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dream Catchers podcast. I'm your host, Jerome, and I have Savanya DeBarros with me today. We've been going back and forth about how I was actually going to say her name. And so I think I said it the way she wanted me to say it. But if not, I'm sure she'll correct me. My you friend, did. how are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm amazing. So I heard you on the Dear Black CEO podcast and I reached out. Well, actually, I, I just dropped the bomb <laughs> on LinkedIn. And I was like, hopefully I get her attention if I put something out here into the internet, the interwebs. And sure enough, she responded. She's actually tending to her social media. So yep. I said, I I got to have you on, right? Because the stories you were sharing, the things you were doing, it it was the essence of being a dream catcher. And you're giving us that social proof that dreams can and should be real. So I'm bragging on you. I'm throwing love on you already. But the listeners have no idea who you are and what you've done. So do me a favor and tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. And just to your point, though, like you did catch my attention because I was like, what, what is this? Who is this? I had to go back and re-listen to that episode because I had totally forgot <laughs> what our conversation was. So for your listeners, if you don't know me, I call myself the protector of athletes. I am a first generation lawyer, law business owner. My whole goal is to educate people so they can move beyond whatever barriers that they have. So I do that through my expertise as a lawyer, but also as a motivator. Um, I'm also a speaker and an author. So I published and, writ and wrote and published a book that turned out to be an Amazon bestseller called What Are You Sporting About? That led to my podcast with the same name. Um, and now I have a book that is launching the end of this month, July 31st, called Athletes Making Moves, Secure Your Future by Protecting Your Name, Image, and Likeness. So that was created <laughs> with college athletes in mind. And um, it's a whole story on that book. But anyway, um, I actually are talking to my professional and retired athletes in that book as well, because one thing that I realized is that athletes have name, image, and likeness outside of college. And so how do you protect it legally? So that's a little bit about me. Wait, my name, image... What's the image and a like? What are you talking yep. about? Nail, name, name, image, and likeness. What What is that? Like, what, what does that actually mean? Talk to me now. <laughs> so, if you follow sports, there's been a whole bunch of stuff going around. Um, it, it really got more serious, I can say, around 2019 um, regarding whether college athletes will have the right to earn compensation based on their name, image, and likeness. So, for years, we know that colleges and coaches and athletic associations have been the only parties generating income off of these athletes backs but now they have the opportunity to go and enter into third-party contracts where they're essentially saying hey this is my brand this is what I do and I want to be compensated for my celebrity as a college athlete now as opposed to trying to wait and go pro um to receive income based on who they are yeah wow and so for the listeners they're like oh well i'm not a college athlete maybe i should just turn this one off wait this impacts on 
there's some opportunity here for you, I would suspect. So can you there break is. that down for the listeners? There Why is this is, relevant right. to them? Yeah, it's relevant to them. So people, so NIL, when people think of NIL, their mind is more so geared towards college athletics because there has been a push um, legis through legislation, different states to have specific rules that allow for athletes to um, receive compensation from their names because NCAA has prohibited that for years, okay? But the idea and the understanding legally is that everyone has a name, an image, and likeness. That is your brand. That's, to, that's what you put out to people. Like for instance, with myself, Protector of Athletes, that's a nickname for me, right? So that if people know, know the Protector of Athletes and don't know my real name, well, then that name becomes associated with me. Um, if there is a particular image that's created based on what the protector of athletes look like, and, you know, where I've garnered the market, that's a part of my likeness as well, right? So one thing that people can think about is um, right of publicity. Not all states have a right of publicity act, which means that no one can receive um, a commercial benefit or compensation on your likeness or your name without an agreement being put in place or you being properly compensated first. So that's stuff that's already on the books. The whole thing now with NIL is just how do we apply that to college athletics so that these athletes can, you know, make their own money from their own name and image and like this. <laughs> so I, I know a guy who trademarked his name. Right. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm trying to get my, I'm trying to get my name back. I was like, that just sounds ludicrous. What do you, what do you mean? I agree. And mm -hmm. So why, I feel like everybody's got to have a personal brand these days. And whether you're being intentional about your personal brand mm -hmm. or not, you have one. Right. And what you're saying is there's an opportunity for you to monetize that, right? There's definitely an opportunity for you to monetize. And for your friend who says that, like, he's trying to get his name back. I'm curious to know what happened to uh, how did he lose it in the first place? Um, you know what I mean? So if they, so people normally think of branding in the sense of, OK, I need to go to someone to create flyers or a logo for me or to market something but there's legal branding, like trademarking, copywriting, um, patenting your work. We're always creating certain things that can build um, or emphasize a brand that we have out there. So Protector of Athletes is actually in the process of being trademarked, <laughs> right? Because there's no one out there that calls themselves a Protector of Athletes except for me. And I'm cornering the market with that name. And so I want to protect it. Um, I think what a lot of people do, especially our brown and black folks, is we go out there and we create all this stuff and we put it out into the world, but we leave ourselves open for other people to take it from us and injure us, you know, financially because we didn't lay the groundwork right the first time. So I'm really curious to know what your friend <laughs> has been dealing with around his name. Yeah, that's for another episode. Mm -hmm. But this thing is, this is so interesting. And so oftentimes we don't know our thing's going to be a big deal, right? Your book, for instance, and which been spun into a podcast. Like, I know you put energy and effort into it, but yeah. I mean, did you know that it was going to be a bestseller? And did you? Like, how did you get to the place where it became a bestseller? Was it just marketing? Like, talk to us a little bit about, like, why this intellectual property is important. Because, you know, everybody just thinks about, oh, I got this jewelry or I got this car. Mm -hmm. or I got a house. They mm -hmm. don't actually think about, like, our thoughts being valuable or the execution of the thoughts being valuable. Yeah, which is the sad thing, because I think we share. It's essential to share certain ideas so that people can help you to cultivate them. But it's also tricky because you don't want to share too much to people who will steal your ideas and they create it into a recognizable brand <laughs> before you have an opportunity to do so. But I hired um, a gentleman to help me set my book up in a way 
like so um, Amazon has like these categories and if you set your book up properly in the category I can't even remember I don't know how he did it but he set up my categories um, to I guess like the buyers who come to the site so that they're the traffic hits my book some kind of way I don't know but anywho it hit bestsellers <laughs> but when I was writing the book I didn't even know what the title was going to be and so I, it was like I was almost done writing the book by the time I, I the title came to me and I remember speaking it to my husband he was like I like that I like that <laughs> yeah and he asked me, he was like, well, how did you, how did you come up with the title? I said, babe, I have no idea. I just, I literally prayed about the book. Um, I was scared to death to write it because I was worried about critics, but it was something that I had to, that I knew I had to do, you know, spiritually. I felt like it was something that needed to happen. And it was always a dream of mine to write a book for athletes and to be in a space where I can speak directly to them, but it scared the crap out of me. And to me, that was like a telltale sign. This is what you're supposed to be doing. So you need to just, you got to move in spite of it, in spite of how scary it is. Wow. Okay. And so tell us about the new book. Like, how did that come about? So <laughs> um, actually, after I wrote What Are You Sporting About, I had been saying that I wanted to write something for my college athletes because the what are you sporting about was geared directly to professional retired athletes but I said okay I need to speak to my college um, athletes in this book because when they go pro I don't want them making the same mistakes that professional athletes make in business so that was kind of like the thought already and then the NIL was already a conversation out there but then the legislation started happening like popping up everywhere I was like oh my gosh I gotta I gotta break this down for them um so that's kind of how it started with me just wanting to talk directly to college athletes on name image and likeness and so it's gone through so many different phases and I'm going to be honest like if you're in business, you also can't be afraid to pivot from what you're doing. I had a completely different book cover. And when I met with a marketing agent, she said, are you married to this book cover? And I was like, mm, I don't know why you don't like it. <laughs> she was like, yeah, I don't like that. And the cover was only college athletes. She was like, what happens to your college athletes when they graduate? can they, do they still have name, image, and likeness? I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, you're right. So everything got scrapped and we did it over. So what you heard from that, that <laughs> what you heard from that interview, that's not even the, the book name anymore. It's athletes making moves. Wow. And so that's the first time I've actually heard a marketer say, hey, you're too niche, go up. Yep. 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 That's exactly what she, what she said, because she was like, what happens to that demographic when they leave college, then what is this something that applies to them? And it, it is completely, it's right. She had a point too. And I hadn't even thought about it. Um, and it gave me a greater opportunity to speak to professional athletes or retire athletes about branding and legal protection, a different way that I hadn't uh talked about in the previous book what are you sporting about okay so the question that comes to mind immediately for me and i've avoided asking it about three times but like how what? how'd you get interested in this like it's so like small small right mm -hmm. how did you get interested in wanting to protect athletes what happened yeah so i'm a former athlete college and um i've been representing business clients for quite a while and one of the things that i was seeing is people were coming to me once there was a ton of crap that hit the fan <laughs> no one was investing in, in counsel when things were going good and beautiful and then when the money was coming in right everybody comes to counsel after crap has happened um 
but it was it was around oh gosh I want to say 2014 when I saw a documentary on um, 30 for 30 gone broke and how a lot of these athletes were losing yes they were losing everything um, that relationships like with significant others child support issues because you know athlete is on child support for a million dollar contract but then their contract don't get extended they're still paying child support for that amount um I mean all kind of stuff and now at that time I was a very new young lawyer and I tried to reach out to my network to talk to athletes and I felt shut down so I didn't you know continue on um but some years later that emotion still drudged up in me and from representing my business clients, I knew I said, okay, I want to represent athletes. I don't necessarily want to be an agent, but I want to represent athletes, but I want to represent them from a business perspective because there's so many athletes who go out, create their own businesses or invest in other people's businesses or <laughs> bring folks into their business. And it just all goes straight to shit. <laughs> excuse my language <laughs> you know what I'm saying because like there's no there's no real foundation that's built into that you know there's no protection everybody try to do things in a reactive type of mode instead of being proactive while you know things are going good so that's how I actually created my niche like who are who are my people wow okay so you're like, I'm sick of these atrocities. I'm going to make the world right by yep. getting in front of people and hopefully doing it in a preventative manner instead of waiting Correct. until everything went wrong. And Correct. you're playing the long game though, right? Because mm -hmm. everybody really just wants the pain pill. They don't yeah. want to take vitamins to avoid getting <laughs> sick. They'd rather get sick and, and take that Excedrin migraine so they can get out of the thing. That is a great way of... of painting the picture for us. So, okay, you start going down the path and it worked out perfectly, right? You just started making a pile of money and you realized that this was the greatest idea ever. <laughs> it's still, it's a long game for me too, right? So it's a long game for the athlete, it's a long game for me. Um, but I am a huge believer that purpose pays for itself not the other way around. You can't find purpose through money. So you can get that money up front, but if it's not driving you, I mean, what happens next? You know what I'm saying? So my whole, my, I just want to make sure that whatever I put out there, whoever I represent, that I'm, I'm doing it from a place of fullness, um, with intensity, with purpose, um, and I just, I honestly believe like when you operate that way, the money will find you. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it will find you. <laughs> but no, I don't have a whole bunch of money sitting over here on the side. No, I, I, I said that to, I said that to pick with you a little bit, right? I, I think the, the thing is when we start these ideas, it's like, oh man, I don't know, but I think. I yeah. know what I think. And then you help somebody and you're like, oh, I'm addicted to this. And so what was that moment for you when you were like, no, I'm on to something. Like, I got to keep going. I call this the red pill moment. Yeah. Um, I think I've had a few of those. I definitely think I've had a few of those. One, one was just with my business clients, people who have, don't have any kind of sports background. Um, just the way that I, I, that I operate, you know, hearing my clients through very difficult times talk about, well, one client actually called me a pit bull. <laughs> just like, oh my God, I got a pit bull on the team because I don't play no games. So I do protect my clients, but um, that was one. But also when I started the podcast and I was so nervous to reach out to certain people. And um, looking back, now I've been doing the podcast for a little bit over a year and the caliber of guests that I've had on the podcast, I'm like, yeah, I'm really onto something. 
because people need to have, hear these conversations. And it's not like anyone is preaching at an athlete or, or those who are attached to an athlete or sports. It's real life experiences, seeing people win, like for real, win and change lives in the midst of it. You know what I'm saying? And so my entire goal, what I love about my book too, is I wrote it for athletes specifically, but individuals who are not athletes, never been athletes, it's been changing their lives. Like I had one guy tell me that um, he recognized that he was living and operating with trauma that he hadn't addressed before. Through my book. Yep. So part of the book, I talk about, there's a chapter called the, um, the pro-victim. Healing yourself, like most athletes go and make crazy decisions now in their adulthood, in their profession, because there's trauma from their childhood that they never addressed. And so it constantly shows back up. So how that chapter came about, I was wondering, like just having a moment with myself, like why? how in the world are these athletes constantly allowing people in their circle who's stealing from them? Like taking all of their worth, right? Think about it. It's something about you and that pain, that hurt, that's still attracting the same thing back to you because you've never healed yourself, right? You've never sat with yourself to find clarity and healing around those things. And so what happens is the same type of decisions that you make will show up into your present day and your future if you don't deal with it. Yep. Ooh, she going deep, y'all. <laughs> y'all better watch out. <laughs> because most people don't want any I part of that. Like, <laughs> most people no, don't want any I part of that. I had to do it that. for myself. Yeah, unfortunately. But at the end of the day is if you don't, if you don't take care of those situations, it will, things can be fine for 10, 15, 20 years, but if it's still there and you have not dealt with it, it will come up. It will come up. Are, are you, are you comfortable enough to tell us about your process and how you figure this out? still figuring figuring it out um a lot of what i talk about i try to i pull from the stories that i've seen heard and also things that i personally have gone through so for me mine is more with the parent but feeling that trauma and there's been other things that have happened in my life but having that trauma and always searching for, okay, you know, is this going to ever be better and hoping that that relationship is different and it never is. So it's like, I need to just focus on me. It's not my fault, but how can I heal Savanya, you know, from back then so that Savanya can operate the way that she needs to now. Right. And so, because the thing is, and I've seen this also with my clients, they go and they make bad business or create bad business relationships the same that look the same way as if they're in a like some type of family dynamic. You can't make business decisions like that. But it's something that's happening from your past or your environment and you're taking that into business. But how do we shift it? How do we start healing the person to recognize that this is not going to operate for my benefit in business, right? So that's, I mean, that's part of my process, just healing, healing thyself, the inner self. And so an, an athlete shows up. Mm -hmm. Do you start having this conversation about life choices with them? Or do you just Not say, all right, here's your name, image, and likeness. We're going to go off to this. Because, I mean, there's a great deal of healing that has to happen. And most people need a guide to, in order to walk through that because it's super uncomfortable. It is super. Um, not off that. And so I try to be, I try to have discernment of when that is a good conversation to have. So for instance, um, one of my athlete clients, we had to have a mindset conversation around money. We didn't go all the way into why 
you know, there's an issue with wanting to spend money on certain things, but we had to have that conversation. I suspect that there may be other things back there. And I did, you know, pull from my own experiences of, okay, I understand that you don't want to do this, but here's the caveat, right? Back to the protection mode. If we don't spend money where it is necessary, you will leave yourself open for harm. Um, and I think, so if we're just using the money example, that is a huge problem with our black and brown community. You know, we, we most of us come from families that have not been well to do, well off with stacks and stacks in the bank. So a lot of us go into business trying to hold on to every single thing that we have, but we can't have a proper return if we've never invested properly into ourselves. Now, the issue is, is that, yeah, we're going to lose sometimes. I've lost sometimes because it's, it's just a part of the game. You have to figure out what works and doesn't work for you. But when you know better, it's time to start doing better. We can't have a proper return if we haven't made the appropriate investment. What's up tribe, it's your host Jerome. I just wanna let you know that we put together a free 15 point checklist for exiting the matrix. Jump on over to dreamshouldbereal.com in order to pick your free copy up. Let's get back to the show. And then let me tell you about that, something for nothing. So in my new book, I talk about accountability. What I love about this book is there's so many sports stories around everything that I talk about, but specifically, Accountability is one of those issues that I talk about in chapter one for the groundwork for the athlete. Um, first off, people don't appreciate things if they get something for nothing, right? If you invested something, you will tend to that so much more because you don't want your investment to go astray. You don't wanna leave empty handed. But when you get it for nothing, it's like, okay, who cares? You know, it's, it's free. <laughs> it's free I'm, I'm just gonna get it but here's the here's the flip side to that too the account accountability aspect is if you constantly have been depending on other people to do something for you to mine something for you that technically should have been your responsibility when the time come for you to step up to the plate you will not have that skill you would not know how to be accountable for yourself and what happens is if you don't know how to be accountable for thyself, how do you lead a team? And in my situation for athletes and business, how do you demand your team, the people who are helping you to create your business or elevate a brand, how do you demand that they be accountable to you if you don't show that same leadership? You don't. Exactly. Yeah, Everybody's I mean, just doing whatever they want to do. Yeah, <laughs> th that is why you have to take the red pill because it starts with your relationship with yourself. And if you're not holding yourself accountable, if you can't look yourself in the mirror and know that you're operating out of a place of integrity, then right. asking somebody else to do that, it's really, really difficult because you don't believe it or expect it of yourself. So exactly. You are spot on there. So <laughs> what's what's been the worst fear in the process? I mean, these folks are coming to you. They don't know what they're doing. They're counting on you to actually keep them safe, keep them in a position of power. And you're like, your mother hen, right? Because the, it, without you, they don't know what to do. And so, I mean, you mentioned Pitbull before and some other things, but mm -hmm. Like, what's been your worst fear in getting involved in these people's lives, which, I mean, turns into their livelihood, literally? Yeah. Yeah. My worst fear is really having the structure to scale up when my clients will need it. So I create partnerships with different individuals, you know, just in business, because I want to make sure that I have resources for my clients that I can't provide them or necessarily provide. Um, and we just also went through like this major shift in technology to support our clients in a better way. So I'm always worried that I won't have 
or or scale up enough to support my clients and people that they may bring in or that may just find me on their own. Um, but personally, I don't want, I always have conversations with my clients, especially about their contract issues. And I, I would hope, I don't think this has happened yet, but I'd hope that my clients would not go against my legal advice to enter a contract that is to their detriment and then later say, oh my gosh, I told you so. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so the fear is you give them proper guidance, they ignore you and then something bad happens. Yeah, yep. Because I mean, I think some people have this, I know it all type attitude regardless of not being an attorney, right? And if it's something that you really, really, really want to do, you sometimes you just defy the advice that was given to you. Well, um, I think I can yeah. get away with it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's what everybody does. Or mm -hmm. do I really need to make that investment? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's expensive. Right. So why are you expensive? Why would I? <laughs> what do you mean you want that much money? just did this by myself it's and that has happened before actually people who have, who have not become my clients um have not taken my advice and went out and done something and then come back and I was like oh yeah I need some services but I've had the opposite also I've given someone advice through a consult and they followed that advice and everything was good Okay. 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 I see what's going on here. So what'd you do before you were practicing for yourself? You said, what did I do? Yeah. Like, were you in house somewhere or were you student. doing it? <laughs> so you left university, left law school and opened your own practice just like that. Mm -hmm. I graduated in 2013 and I set form past the bar the same year. I applied to jobs. So I got barred in October of 2013. I searched for jobs. It was the end of October that I was barred. So November, December, and January didn't have an offer. So I was like, you know, I gotta, I, I'm just going to have to stand on faith over here. <laughs> and, but I prayed about it. I was like, if I don't have a job offer by the end of January 30, 30th or 31st of that following year, which was 2014 in my case, I'm just gonna open my own practice. And that's what I did. So February 22nd, 2014, I registered my business and started taking clients. Wow. I was more afraid of waiting too long to have real court experience. And I didn't wanna be one of those lawyers who all I did was like doc document review for two years. And then I still can't get a job because then people will be like, oh, well, you don't have experience. <laughs> and that happens. That happens. I was like, you know what? Screw it. But one of the best things happened for me in such a scary period of my life is as a, a baby lawyer, I have been able to go out there and litigate cases against folks that have been in, in practice for 20 something years, right? Whereas most attorneys who go into firms, you're not, you're not first off handling those cases that way and you're not gonna be a first chair in trial. But that was me. I was able to do that because I was on my own. Woo doggy. So <laughs> not only did you open a firm, but you started litigating right off the bat right off the bat okay so you got your first time going in the court how what, what's the feeling like what's the night oh before and what's the morning of? i was so horrible oh my god i was so nervous and then one thing i realized is no one no one follows the civil rules of evidence <laughs> in that particular case that i was in it was just like a straight crap show um I was super nervous. I still get nervous, but now I have more years under my belt. So, you know, the nervousness is a lot more controlled. And I think it just helps me because 
I know I want to do a good job for my clients. Um, my clients for me tend to become part of the family. When someone is in my head or their matter is in my head, it's like something weird can happen. And, and I always think back, oh, I need to do such and such for this client or this case. Like I'm always strategizing, trying to find ways that I can help my client. So for me, the nerves are definitely there, but a lot more controlled. It's, it's more like to help me do better, you know, to really drive a, a point home. Um, but it was, it was so nerve wracking when I first started. <laughs> I can't imagine. Cause usually you get the, watch somebody else do it and take notes and ask questions about why they did it and say, I would have done it this way if <laughs> I was doing it and they don't know what they're talking about, but no, you walked in and you're like, I'm here. I'm yeah. ready to rock and roll. Yeah. What gave you that courage? Is that like a recurring theme in your life where um, you just go try stuff? <laughs> um, I love how you said that, a recurring theme. <laughs> well, I had trial experience from law school. So I clerked for the state attorney's office for a year. I went to the attorney general's office for like a semester. I was also a part of this advanced trial techniques course in law school. Um, also on the trial team. So I, I had the foundation there. Um, but I've just always been a very determined person. You know, if there was something I wanted to do, yeah, it may scare me, but I'm like, is that a reason not to do it? Right. So I just, I don't know, just motivate myself and just do it. Like I have to just keep talking to myself and those nerves have never gone away. Like even when I was a child or even in college, I would be sitting in the blocks waiting for, you know, the person to, to call the race, you know, to sh shoot off that gun for us to go. And oh my God, the butterflies are just going the whole way through. But as soon as I'm into that, that event, it was just like, I'm just, I'm here, I'm here in the zone doing the in thing the that I do. Yep. Wow. This is so cool. So as we kind of wind this thing down, I, I got a few questions. I, I call it okay. the final four. The first one is what are you most grateful for? Oh my God. Ooh, during a crazy time like this, I'm, I'm so thankful to just be here to have the ability um, to dream up beautiful things, which sometimes I feel like it's a blessing and a, and a curse. But I'm so thankful that I'm here, that I can create and see things through. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Love it. <laughs> what dream are you most focused on catching next? Say that again. What dream are you most focused on catching next? Oh, man, there's so many. Um, I have a desire to write a book about my grandmother who passed November 2nd of 2020. Um, I, I think that's, that's really it. She inspired me in so many different ways. She was my ultimate life investor. I'm a lawyer. I always tell people I'm a lawyer because of her. You know, if it wasn't for her, I don't know if I would have been able to do it. Um, and just all the life lessons, the financial lessons that she gave me. I really want to, I, I want to give back, you know, some kind of way and tell my story that includes her to further impact other people because she was just she was one of those people who gave, gave freely and gave from the heart. And so whatever I do, I feel like I'm getting emotional just talking about her. Whatever I do, I, I want her spirit to really just move through me to send that message. That's beautiful. That's love right there. Yeah. Right? Through and through. And just a yep. generous heart is, I think, the best way you can show that you love others. Yes. Yeah. Why you what gift are you giving the world? Mm. 
That's a great question. And I'm I'm not like, I have to really think about it because I think the gift that I give the world is my authenticity. In a time that is built around, I'm just gonna say it, fakeness. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it like everybody's trying to show that they look a certain way or have something and may not like I really feel like the authentic part is getting missed and lost in the shuffle which also is causing a lot of confusion with folks and so one thing that I love to hear from people is how real I am with them um, that they see somebody consistent, that they know that whether the, whether, whether the advice I have for them is something that they want to hear or not, they can expect that I will give them, you know, real, true, authentic advice. And that I'm just me. You know, what you see is what you get. And no one has to worry that, you know, from day to day, I'm going to change and be somebody else. So I think that honestly, out of everything is my gift to the world. It's just being authentic. So I want to throw more love on you because I, <laughs> I think that is the game changer, right? When people have to trust you with something that's so precious, they need to know who they're giving that to. Yeah. And your ability to be authentic is a thing that I think accelerates the ability to create the bridge yeah for the trust to actually exchange and happen yeah and i think the world isn't so much about the fake as it is what do i have to show you in order to get what i want right right and why does it have to be that way though you know what i'm because saying because that's what marketing is right i gotta <laughs> tell true. you the message i gotta show you the thing and well, why I, can't I gotta... we show why can't we market who we are you know well, like I think we should, right? And okay. I, I I believe that that is the the way that we don't make poor choices in the beginning, and then we're spending all the time. Now, with yeah. that said, like if everybody was the way that they are, then we probably don't need your services, right? I feel you. <laughs> because everybody's above <laughs> board with it, right? Yep, I feel you. So you know, and there's. And I don't want to put you out of a job, right? But th don't the fact of the matter job. is, <laughs> because people are deceptive, we need folks to protect, right? That's why the contracts are necessary. That's why That's you need true. to protect your your yeah. IP, right? Yep. And I just I love it, and I, I I'll be honest, like I've I've done enough of taking photos and photoshopping and stuff, and I, it's fun, right? I, yeah. I love it, and I think it. It's not because I, I want to steal their thing, even though I think the image is cool. I just want to be a part of the story, right? And yeah. so it's really all in fun. So, but at the end of the day, like, if you can be authentic and show that you have a genuine heart, mm -hmm. I think people are going to accept that. And yeah. if they don't, then why do you want to work with them anyway? Right. And think about it, too. If people don't, here's the thing. A lot of people may want to work with you for what they think you may have, right? All the shiny stuff that coats you. But when those people take that stuff off or they remove that, what's left? And so if someone doesn't want to work with you from, you know, just who you are, well, you don't lose anything. You gain something because the worst thing you can do is to go in business with somebody who you don't know, who you don't trust or don't even like, right? But you also do yourself a disservice by technically putting your true self on the back burner to appease other people. And you have the benefit of never having gone in the corporate. So you've been out here wild and free for a long time, okay. but that <laughs> is the, that's the commentary that I hear from yeah. most people who are trying to make that escape from the matrix is, yeah. well, I can't be myself. I can't show people who I am. And it's really interesting when it starts on social, it's like, well, can I post about this or can I talk right. about that? There's a lot of anxiety you? behind it. Yeah. Well, people might judge me. 
Mm-hmm. Do you judge you? Mm-hmm. And if mm-hmm. you don't, then I, I don't understand the reasoning. And right. so that this is this has just been an amazing conversation. I'm, I'm so grateful for you and the work that you're doing. And I I wish you many more prosperous and healthy years practicing and <laughs> impacting people's lives in a way that they would probably not go find somebody who looks like you to do it, right? Yeah. Because there's just it's such a small field and there's so few people who are actually experienced. And the fact that you'll actually go litigate is a game yeah. changer because everybody wants to settle. Yes. Right? How can we settle this? How can we make sure it doesn't go to court? Or how can I just write a scary letter to get them to cease yep. and desist? And, yep. you know, well, <laughs> That's probably not always the best answer. There's a reason. Now, with that said, when you go to court, you have no idea what's going to happen. You, as you talked about your first go around. Mm-hmm. But if if it becomes a matter of principle instead of a dollar game, right? Then you you actually have to go argue it. And yeah. so, so and that's Vanya, advice I give my clients too. Yeah. 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 So, Vanya, thank you so much for joining us. The final question. Is what's the one thing you want the listeners to take away from this episode? Ooh, be yourself, honey. Be yourself at all costs. <laughs> be yourself. Because when everything is done, said and done, you will feel much better knowing that you were really true to thyself. I want to say this. There was a Bible study that we had a few weeks ago. And the pastor posed this question, what do you think is most important, having a good name or having a lot of money? When you are true to yourself, you create a good name and everything else flows to you because you were true to thyself and created a good name. People have multi-generational wealth because their forefathers created a good name that people trust, right? So that's my advice. Wow. Back to name likeness, right? It all comes back. (laughs) I didn't think about that, but that is a good way to bring it back. (laughs) It all comes back, name likeness and image. Yes. Savannah, thank you so much. This has been an outstanding and amazing episode. Thank you so much. (laughs) And to the listeners, your dreams should be real. We'll talk soon. Thank you for joining the tribe today. We would love to hear from you. Please don't forget to rate, like, and share. Perhaps someone you know could benefit from what we've discussed. Until the next time, remember that your dreams should be real.